formal charge is a very important aspect of the Lewis structure concept. And what formal charge refers to is a formal surplus or deficiency of electrons on an atom. We call it formal because it may not necessarily represent the actual charge on the atom, but it's a useful concept because we can use it to think about the reactivity of positive or negatively charged atoms within Lewis structures. Let me give you an example. So consider the ethoxide anion. Ethoxide anion contains two carbons. We can represent those carbons in shorthand by simply drawing two corners here and here, and then an oxygen atom here is the oxide part. The ide means that the oxygen is negative, and to see why it's negative, consider the electrons on that oxygen. So the oxygen is an, an example of an atom with four electron pair domains and three non-bonded lone pairs. So the structure we get is the structure shown here. To calculate formal charge, you consider the number of electrons that the neutral atom normally has, oxygen being a period two element, normally has six valence electrons, excuse me, and being in group 16, it normally has six valence electrons. Um, however, in the structure we see here, formally oxygen possesses seven electrons. It possesses six electrons in the form of these lone pairs, and then one more from this bond here. So we consider that electron as being belonging to the oxygen. And for formal charge, that's a general idea. When calculating formal charge, consider half of a bond as belonging to each atom. So a doubly bound atom, for instance, will contain two electrons from the double bond. Both of the electrons closer, in a sense, to the oxygen atom will belong to that oxygen atom for the purposes of formal charge. So noting in ethoxide that the oxygen has seven valence electrons and ordinarily neutral oxygen only possesses six, we see that the oxygen has a formal charge of negative one. We represent that by drawing a negative sign next to the oxygen. Now organic chemistry is all about the movement of electrons from electron rich regions to electron poor regions. Understanding that concept will take you very far in organic chemistry. So in other words, if you can understand that this electron rich atom, which possesses one more electron than it would like to have, wants to give up a pair of its electrons to some other atom or molecule, you can begin to think of this molecule, ethoxide, as what's called a nucleophile, an electron donor. This is a molecule that wants to give up electrons, and we can represent the giving up of electrons through a curved arrow like this. Now let's take a look at an example of an electrophile, a molecule that wants to accept electrons and be at the other end of that arrow. And using formal charge, we can think about electrophiles in a very clear way. And here's how. So just as nucleophiles are negative, we might expect electrophiles, which are electron deficient species, to be positive. And that's definitely the case. So consider the nitrogen shown here. Nitrogen of the trimethyl ammonium cation. This nitrogen possesses four electrons, one each from each of the sigma bonds associated with it. And as a result, because nitrogen normally prefers five, being in group 15, we would say this nitrogen has a positive charge. With that positive charge, the nitrogen is now a great electrophile. It wants to accept more electrons in order to neutralize it. It can do that by accepting electrons at the hydrogen atom and then donating those electrons towards the nitrogen. So what we can see is that the positive charge serves as sort of a handle to indicate to us that this molecule is a great electrophile. It wants to accept electrons to the hydrogen 
so that it can eventually neutralize the nitrogen atom. Just as a thoxide was a great nucleophile because of the negative charge, this molecule is a great electrophile because of its positive charge. And formal charge can help clue you in to those key structures in organic molecules. So let's bring it all together with an example of real structures now. One molecule that you may be familiar with is the amino acid of biochemistry. So amino acids possess an amino group that we represent like so, actually with one fewer hydrogen, I apologize, and a carboxylic acid group two atoms away. And here again, I'm using the shortcut of representing a carbon as a vertex of two intersecting lines. There's the carboxylic acid, and if we draw in the lone pairs so that every atom has an octet, we'll see that every atom is neutral based on formal charge arguments here. Now attached to that carbon at the vertex, we need two more groups, two more single bonds. One of these will typically be a hydrogen, we represent as H, and the other will be a side chain that I'll just generically represent as R. So there's an example of the structure of an amino acid, and there's one more thing missing. Hopefully you could spot it. Whoops, let me get out of the way here. What's missing is a lone pair on the amino nitrogen. And now we have all neutral atoms, all containing an octet of electrons, and I would encourage you to go back and uh, check this on your own. Now, oftentimes, you're going to see problems where you're given a formula and you're asked to draw the Lewis structure. And I just wanted to finish off the lesson today by giving you a few pointers on how to approach these problems. So the first thing you should do is count up all of the valence electrons in all of the atoms in the molecular formula. So for instance, say you're given the molecular formula, oh, I don't know, C5H10N. With that formula, we would see that we would need 30, or we would possess 30 valence electrons from carbon. Carbon has six valence electrons. Plus 10 from the hydrogens. Plus five from the nitrogen for a total of 45 valence electrons. And this is a number that you won't see very often for reasons we'll come up against later. But basically, an odd number of electrons indicates an interesting species. We don't often see species with odd numbers of electrons in organic chemistry. Once you count up those valence electrons, then proceed to build a sigma structure. My number one piece of advice at this stage is be sure to keep atoms of high valence, atoms that form a large number of bonds, towards the center. Doing that, you'll make sure that atoms with smaller valence that can form a more limited number of bonds will be on the outskirts, and that will almost always get you closer to the correct answer for these kinds of problems. Once you've got the sigma structure down, then move to thinking about lone pairs. So for instance, we see here in NH3 that everything is taken care of, essentially, whoops, this way. Everything is taken care of except for an octet on the nitrogen. And the nitrogen also appears to be missing two electrons, right? It's possess it possesses on formal charge terms three, one from each of the sigma bonds, but it's missing a pair. If we add that pair in, we see we take account of both problems at once. The nitrogen now has an octet. Considering the sharing of electrons, that nitrogen possesses eight electrons. And on formal charge grounds, it's now neutral. So take account of pi bonds and lone pairs last when you're drawing your structures. And that's really all there is to it.